The definition of endurance is the capacity of something to last or to withstand wear and tear. Okay, things that withstand wear and tear cost more than stuff that don't last long. Right? That's what endurance is about. I, it's the capacity of something to last and to withstand wear and tear. So when you're talking about, you know, even moving here to this ministry, for some of y'all coming here was, I mean, that was a big thing for you to come all the way here for a ministry. It was a big thing. But you knew what you needed for your family. So it's you knew in the long run it's going to be worth me making this sacrifice to come here. Right? Because in the long run, you want to have what you need for your family, and you want your family coming up around adamant believers. You want your children coming up, you know, with like-minded believers. Amen? So it's worth the sacrifice. It may have been hard, but it was worth the, you know, worth the sacrifice. And so endurance is all about something being worth something. If it's worth something to you, you're going to endure. This race that we're we're running for Jesus and running for the Lord. It's worth everything to me. So that means that I can't let anything stop me. I'm going to have to go through whatever I have to go through to make it, but I'm going to continue until the end. Amen? That's what it's worth to me. And endurance is all about uh, something lasting and withstanding wear and tear. Giving up is not a kingdom option. Okay? So quitting is just not an option. I'm more and more, I'm getting emails and emails and emails from women that are telling me that their husbands just woke up one day and decided to leave. And I mean, literally, just, and most of the time, there's a baby on the way. I don't know what it is about that baby on the way when you already have two or three, but for some reason, that just flips dude switches. And I mean, I talked to one guy on the phone. I was like, dude, are you going to really leave your family and your wife? You're just going to leave? She's pregnant and you already have three children. You're going to just leave her? Man, I just can't do this, man. I, you know, I'm just, do you acting like it's a basketball, pick up basketball game? I can't play, man. I just can't. I, we talking about your kids that look like you. You're going to just leave humans, people? It's too hard. I just can't do it. Just a quitter. And I don't understand that. That don't even register with me because, I mean, I just couldn't see myself leaving my children like that. You know what I'm saying? But guys are doing it. It's too hard. They can't make it. But we don't have quitters in here. Amen? We don't, have, we don't even have men that talk about quitting. Man, what you going to do? Where you going? Look at somebody say, where you going to go? We're going to find you. <laughs> Luke, Luke 9 and 62. Jesus said unto them, No man, having put his hands to the plow and looking back, is what? Any man that says he's going to do it and then stops doing it ain't fit for the kingdom. God don't deal with quitters. Right? And who said this? Jesus said it. Now, you're going to have a moment where you're going to want to quit. Anybody had a want to quit moment? Yeah, you did. Yes, you did. Raise your hand. Everybody. Everyone. All the elders, too. Get your hands up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've had a... Because if, if you haven't had a I want to quit moment, then you better than Jesus. Because in the garden, Jesus had a I want to quit moment. Well, in the garden, he was like, Lord, there's got to be another way. There's got to be another way. Could you imagine what he was feeling, what he was getting ready to do? It's like, man, if there's just any other way. So he had a quit moment, one a quit moment, but then right after that, he said, Lord, but God, is not my will. It ain't about me, so whatever you want. But nobody here is better than Christ, so, hey, you're you going to have... Uh, I want to quit moment. Some of you single brothers had one. You ain't done nothing yet. You have done nothing yet at all. And you talking about quit. You, boy, don't let me talk about that. Pastor, I just don't know if I can make it. Make what? You ain't done nothing. You 
you already want to quit? You ain't even started nothing yet? Man, you're going to have it rough. It's going to be real bad when you really start doing something. But no man that has put his hands to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom. I like the story of Lot. When, when God told Lot, get your wife, get everybody out, what did he tell them not to do? Don't look back. In order to be fit for the kingdom, you must first agree with God. This is very important. God has a plan for your life. Listen, y'all. When the Bible says the wages of sin is death, he really means literal death. You will pay for sin physically. It's real. A lot of folks are dying because of sin. And it's not just sin like killing folks and being gay and all that kind of stuff. But it could be sin of not following God's plan. Being out of God's will is sin. Did you know that? Being out of his will is sin. So if you go your own way, the Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof is what? What is it? What is it? Death. So you can literally be doing things the wrong way against God's will and plan for you, and you'll die. Yeah, this stuff is real. Our life is based on us following God's plan for our life. The age that men are even dying at is younger now because they are less likely now to follow God's plan for. So it's very important to do what God, look at somebody say, do what God says. Do what God says. And don't give me that. I don't know. Yes, you do. You know. You are not going to stand before God and pull that one. You're going to know. You know now. You know how you know? Because God speaks it to you. You look in the mirror and you hear it. You're just scared to do it. Man, it wakes you up in your sleep. You're scared to do it. You know it. God has a plan for your life. You must agree with this plan to, uh, in order to truly trust him. Getting saved is not just getting forgiveness of sin, but it is actually agreeing to follow the will of God for your life. This is where they really got it wrong. His plan must be done his way in order for you to endure. I mean, the Baptist church, they would bring a chair up. And they would open the doors of the church and they would have somebody sit in the chair and they would give them the right hand of fellowship and they would say that that person is saved. But they never tell that person that not only are your sins forgiven, but for not, from now on, your will is gone. They, they don't ever say that. Like, your, it's over. You know that, right? Your will is gone. You're going to leave your will right here, too. So you're going to get up, but in order to truly be saved, you're going to leave your will here. Because in order to go after Christ, follow after Christ, you must first deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. Right? So you can't just say the sinner's prayer, whatever that is, and you can't just sit in the chair, and they can't baptize you real quick. None of that's going to work if you don't leave your will there. That's what being saved is. Being saved is not claiming salvation. Being saved from sin, the reason you're saved from sin is because you no longer follow sin. You follow Christ who defeated sin. Hebrews 10 and 36, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done what? The will of God, you may receive what? What is promised. So you need endurance because it ain't going to happen all at one time. You got to make it all the way to the end. And when you have done the will of God, you can receive what is promised. Does that make sense? Then you must be taught when you receive sound doctrine. And man, you know, I don't celebrate y'all enough in here, but I really, really, really dig y'all in here. Because most of y'all in here 
went against a whole lot of opposition to bring your family to ABC. Like you was a G when you got here. I'm serious. Some of y'all were heroes just because of how you got here. And you guys have come from miles around, from miles away and just really deciding to plant your family in here and to be here. And y'all, that's big. And it means a lot because it means you're serious about this part I'm reading now. You want it sound doctrine, right? You want it sound doctrine, you came and got it. Amen. You wasn't emailing me like everybody do. Is there a church in my area? I don't know. Can you refer me to the, all I know is what we doing here. Somebody put that on the internet uh, today. I mean, you talking about all this stuff, but what is the church doing? Well, what Adam and Believers Council is doing, I can speak on that. I don't know about the other churches. But many of you came from miles away to plant your family here because you mean business. And you wanted sound doctrine. You wanted to be a part of where sound doctrine was. When you receive sound doctrine, you will learn how to properly apply the word of God and understand how to keep standing during difficult times. So that's what that's what we do. Sometimes you hear the word and it's good. Oh, man, the word was good today. But then you start going through something and you remember what the word said. The word is a light and lamp when follow. It will lead you out of what? dark places. Understanding God's plan is the first step in following God's plan. So God already spoke to you, told you the plan. Most of you knew, hey, I want to provide for my family, want to protect my family, want to be the priest of my family. So you came here so you can get information on how to go about doing that. Psalms 13, 113, I'm 119 and 105 says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. So this is how we know where to go. We know where to go based on what we're learning, what we're reading, and what we're understanding. Amen? But you can't just read it. You got to get an understanding. That's what the pastor's for. That's the part most people skip. They skip over that part because they believe they can get their own understanding whenever they feel like it. But they don't understand, you know, your understanding is going to be skewed based on what you're going through. You know, when you're going through something, you can't hear it the way it would sound if somebody else was saying it. It's different. It's different. You can encourage yourself all day long, but it's not the same when someone else encourages you and you know God sent them to. It's different. It feels different. It sounds different. And it's definitely more more beneficial. Then you must be tried. This is the part nobody likes. I don't like this part, but it's inevitable. The devil will come to test what you are learning. Everything you learn in here, you're going to be tested on. You might as well just take some notes. It's coming back. You're going to be tested on it. That was going to try to test you. You better be ready for it. The more you learn, the more tests going to come. But the good part is the more you learn, the more equipped for the test you are. The devil will come to test what you're learning. He will try to steal the word that you are receiving away from you. He wants you to go back on what you promised and renege on your agreement to do things God's way. Y'all know how many folks are doing this? Going back on what they said. You know the worst part about going back on what you said is what your wife gonna think about you. That, that's the thing. That, 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 that's the big thing on me. Man, I just, I, I mean, if I say it, I mean, I might have to just die trying to do it before I let my wife think I'm a quitter. And that's always the first thing when folk come to, come, you know, we have the meeting, me and the other Aaron, and they come to us and, you know, you know, they mad about either money or not being seen or didn't get what they wanted, whatever, whatever. Brother, so what is your wife going to think? You told your wife that God sent you here. This is the ministry that you should be planted at, and I am a prophet, and you are following sound doctrine, and there's no other word around like the word that's coming out of ABC. No other church. This is where we belong. This is where God has brought us. Oh, this is where. The... What you going to tell her? That's, that's a concern for me, and it ought to be a concern for you. And it always happens. They always do that. And it, but I'm like, but dude, your wife is going to, it's going to change the way she views you the next time you say the Lord told you something. And so, amen. 
Don't go, look at somebody say, keep your word. Just keep your word. Don't go back on what you said. Keep your word. Amen. He will try to steal the word that you are receiving away from you. He wants you to go back on what you promised and renege on your agreement to do things his way. But you will never be tested above what you can endure. Y'all know the song, he won't put no more on you than you can bear. God will never do that. So the test, you, is, the test is passable. Always. God's tests are always passable. You can pass God's test, but oh, just make sure you're not giving the enemy more to test you with than God allows. Yeah, you can pass God's test because God is not going to tempt you. But if you yield into temptation, you just add it to the test. Amen. That's why it's best to just, look at somebody and say, live right. When you live right, you're ready for God's test. But if you're creeping and slipping and sliding and ducking and dodging and peeping and hiding, then when the test come, you think it's a curse for what you're doing wrong in secret. And you can't get you can't get past it mentally because you think you're being punished for the sin. And God's test wasn't even that hard. Because you know you'd be walking around when you're in sin, you just, I mean, you paranoid. Things start going bad. Oh, that's because <laughs> that's because of the you know the okey doke. I better stop. But I, that's what I'm saying. You 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 mess yourself up with you got secret sins and junk going on because you don't know where the where, who, if you're being punished, if you're gonna die. Amen. <laughs> so it's best to just live right. Amen? Especially if you live like in the hood, in a bad neighborhood, you should always live right. How you gonna be in sin in the hood? You might get shot at any time. You need the protection of God's angels over your house all the time. Amen? You hear gunshots every night, you better be saved and living right. <laughs> First Corinthians 10 and 13. There have no te temptation taken you, but such that is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted. Above that ye are able. But with the temptation also do what? Make a way of escape, that ye may be able to what? That's the problem. Folks ain't escaping or taking the way. When, when God speaks to you and gives you the way of escape, take it. Take, look at somebody and say, take it. When soon as God opened up that crack, take it. You better take it then and avoid it so you can bear the test. And finally, you must have faith. When seemingly impossible circumstances and situations come, supernatural power is needed. So if we all think we're going to make it on our strength, then let's just not come to church no more. If you think you're just going to make it, just make, I'm just going to make good decisions all the time and everything's going to be good and I'll be able to do this, then you might as well just be an atheist. You don't need God. No, God's going to make sure everyone in this room needs him. I promise you it's never going to get good enough for you to not need God. He's not going to let it. It could be going perfect. Something going to happen and because he wants you to need him. He's supernatural. So you can handle things in the natural, but man, he's going to make sure you hit them crusty knees at some point. Y'all, let me tell you something. It's best to hit the knees on your own. Repent on your own. Talk to him now. Be spiritual now. Amen. Don't wait till your marriage has fallen apart before you start fasting. Fast now. Don't wait till you lose your job and can't pay a bill before you start reading the word. Read the word. Read it now. Amen. Do it. I'm telling you, do it now. When seemingly impossible circumstances, situations come, supernatural power is needed. Now, y'all know God is still powerful, right? Yeah, he's a miracle worker. He can do things, right? That's why we have to keep a relationship with him so we don't just try to use him when we need something. 
When we have done all that we can do, we must not lose faith. Our faith moves God, and our faith can move mountains as well. Ephesians 3 and 20. Now unto him that is able to do what? Exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh where? In us. So God's power. Look at this scripture. I, you need to memorize this scripture. If you've talked to me one-on-one, -on -one, I've, I've quoted it to you because this is my scripture, how I live my life. I never forget that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all, right? But it's above all that I'm able to ask, and it's above all that I'm even able to what? So when I get in a situation that I can't figure out, I need exceeding abundantly above all. If I could think of it, I wouldn't be in that situation. But I, God will put you. He will allow you to get in a situation where there's nobody to call on but him. So he can show himself mighty. Exceeding abundantly above all that we can even ask or think. Man, I've gotten before God sometimes, and I said, Lord, I don't even know what to ask. But you know. Tell me what to ask. Tell me what to think, because right now my thoughts suck. I can't think of a way out of this. And God will always take me back. Well, see, remember when you did this, you should have done that. And sometimes I got to throw myself on the mercy of the court. You know, in the Bible days, it would be sackcloth, ashes, butt naked on the floor. That's what they did. Like, man, I yes, I blew it. So let me just take my clothes off and roll on the ground. Because that's what I am. Nothing. I'm trash. Help me, Lord. When we've done all that we can do. Now, this is the good thing. Because when you're doing it God's way. Then when you run out of, you've done all that you can do, but you've been doing it God's way, this is when his supernatural power comes in. Now, he ain't going to give you, he ain't going to empower you to do what he don't want you to do. Why would he empower and enhance you to do what he don't want you to do? So you have to be doing what he wants you to do. And if you're doing what he wants you to do, then supernatural power can come in. When we've done all that we can do, we must not lose faith. Our faith is what moves him, and it will move mountains too. Now unto him that is able to do what? Now unto him that is able. He's able to do way more than you can ask or think, but you got to be in his plan to get it. Endurance comes from, number one, biblical examples. Reading the stories of God's men in the Bible that overcame great obstacles to finish their course is very encouraging during tough times. So when you're really going through Bible characters, just start going down the list. You'll find yourself in there. You will find what you're going through in one of them. And it's going to encourage you because you're going to see how they made it through and endured until the end. These are great clouds of witnesses to the power of God. So these men's stories can definitely encourage you when you're in tough times. Another way, uh, another th uh, way endurance comes through earthly examples. Biblical examples are great, but we also need natural examples to encourage us when possible. Amen? Being around godly men that are not quitters will strengthen you. Amen? I don't hang around no quitter. I ain't being around nobody that put his hand to the plow and look back. Brother, you make me look bad. I don't want to be around you. You, you discourage me. Amen? I ain't, I, no, no. I need to be around folks that no matter what happens, they're going to complete it. I'm going to stick to what I said. Even when they fail at times, seeing people press through failures is very encouraging picking themselves up, dusting themselves off, and continuing to go. That's encouraging. Amen? Yeah, because most of these Bible characters, they, they had some blunders too. Right? They had some blunders, but they picked themselves and they, they took it to the house. 
Ain't nothing wrong with dropping the ball as long as you pick it back up and keep running. Well, it is something wrong with dropping it. But pick it back up and keep running. Amen? And finally, endurance comes from personal victories. The more you overcome, the more your faith is what? Strengthened. You can find strength to continue when you have persevered through tough times in the past. God will remind you of stuff that you overcame when you in new stuff. You're going through new stuff, but you got a history of over. That's why if you keep running, some stuff you're going to graduate from. And when it comes back up, you can remember, oh, man, I've been through this before. I know what to do. I just wait on God. I know what to do. I just do this. I know what I've been here before. That's because you passed that test before. You persevered through it in the past. So that means that it's, it's not new to you. You can make it through. The hardest part of any race is the finish. Anybody ever ran track? Distance track. Four, four hundred. Stuff like that. At the end, you have nothing. And no matter how in your mind, you just, oh, yeah, let me, you don't have nothing. It's gone. That's the hardest part of the race. But runners usually search for a second win to get through long races. So they train you on how to conserve, conserve that win so that you can have a second win. Well, when it comes to spiritual things, God is our second win, always. Though we may have said that we are determined to finish, trials and tribulations are going to wear us down. They just are. This is when we need that second win. We need God's power to finish. You can't finish on your own. You won't finish on your own. If you finish on your own, you get the glory. We can finish with God's power, and it is our faith in him that will give us the endurance we need. It's not about how you start or the mistakes you make along the way. It's about the agreement we make with God to finish the race he has set before us. When we make an agreement with God, we must never quit. We must finish. Amen? Luke 22 and 31. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may what? Sift you like wheat. In other words, test you. And you know Jesus is going to lie because the next verse he said, but I prayed for thee. That thy faith, what? Fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen what? Thy brother. So Jesus basically said, I ain't stopping him. He's going to sift you like wheat. He asked, could he sift you? And I'm not stopping him. I just prayed for you. Prayed that you'll make it and your faith will not what? Fail. And then, Jesus, this next part is the most powerful because if Jesus is Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, he's all of that, got access to everything that's ever happened, knows what's going to happen, he basically encouraged Peter better than Peter could even be encouraged when he said, and when you are converted, meaning when you finish this, change and be who I intended for you to be, strengthen your brothers. So in other words, he's going to sift you, but I prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Matter of fact, your faith is not going to fail because you're going to be converted. And when you're converted, you're going to write my books. And that's what he's telling us all. That's, that's, that's it. That's why you're here. You're here to finish. You're going to go through. It's going to be painful. You're going to want to quit. He's going to sift you like wheat, but you're going to make it. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. Everyone in here. That's what it's all about, making it. Right? And you'll be able to teach your sons how to make it. Amen? You'll be able to teach your daughters how to marry a man that's going to make it. But you're going to make it. Just keep your hands to the plow and what? Don't look back. Everyone bow your heads. God, we just thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you for this truth. And God, thank you for encouragement. 
so we can all stay on the right course, the right path, persevere. Lord, we don't want to let you down. We don't want to let ourselves down. We don't want to let our wives and our family down. We want to stay the course. So God, help us as your heroes. Stick to the plan. Stay the course and finish the race in Jesus' name.